What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 90 of The Sean Lowry Show. I can't believe I'm into the 90s of the podcast. Uh, my guest today is Nicholas Bailey. He's the uh, CEO of The Billion Dollar Body and a creator of The Billion Dollar Brotherhood, which is a group. Uh, he's the host of his own podcast, an international speaker, and he's the author of a book called The Modern Day Businessman, Success Without Sacrifice. And I asked him about that. He's really insightful, really smart. I love talking to him. He works very closely with his wife, similar to me. So we talk about that. Many great insights. I really, really enjoy talking to him. And I hope you enjoy the podcast. Episode 90. Here we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sean Lowry Show. I have Nicholas Bailey here with me. Did I say that right? Yeah, dude, you hit it right on nail on the head. I, people <laughs> always mess up my whole life, and you actually crushed that. So good job. I love it. I love it. All right, so I'm into the uh, '90s of my of my podcast. I'm into like the 90th episode, and I'm trying something different. I'm going to start off with a 90 second uh, like rapid fire question thing to kind of open up your who you are to the audience and to me a little bit, and just kind of open up the conversation. Sound good? You ready? Get it. Yeah, I was I'll born in you on the, the 90s. Spot. I'm ready for this. Let's get it. <laughs> All right, 90s kid. All right, so I got a timer here, right? All right, let's hit it. All right, what is your favorite book? The Bible, for sure. The Bible, okay. Uh, who's your favorite entrepreneur? Uh, wow, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with Gary Vaynerchuk. Oh, Gary V. Okay. All right. Uh, who's somebody that you wouldn't mind punching in the face? Nobody. Nobody uh, in the I world. Guess, technically, I would say that all those freaking guys that are child predators and all that stuff, I wouldn't mind. Okay. In the face. All right. Punch a child predator in the face. That's good. Uh, yeah, what's yeah. your favorite kind of music? Huh. <sighs> Worship music, Christian worship music for sure. Christian worship music. All it's right. It's interesting. Most people don't know this stuff about me, so it's yeah. kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, over the next 10 years, would you rather own Bitcoin or the S&P 500? Bitcoin, for sure. Who's your favorite comedian? Um, my favorite comedian is that Bill Burr guy. That guy's freaking Bill Burr? hilarious. I yeah, love yeah. Bill Burr, dude. He's awesome. Uh, Twitter or Snapchat? Twitter. Favorite sports team? Oh, dude, I'm a motocross guy. So I follow yeah. like specific athlete. I, I love Ken Rocks and you got to look him up. He's, he's an okay. inspiration. I don't know him. Yeah, okay. You got to check him out. All right. Uh, what's your dream car? Lamborghini. Lamborghini. And boom, that's 90 seconds. All right. So that was uh, that was something new I'm trying. And I like that. Kind of open it up a little bit. Yeah, um, man. I'm like learning stuff about myself. Uh, I'm like, I would punch <laughs> some people in the face, but I don't have a specific name. And yeah, that was a good answer. That was a good answer. Yeah, there's there's people that I would anyone who tries to come and mess with my family as well. I would definitely I wouldn't punch them in the face though. I would blow their head off with a with a shotgun <laughs> or maybe like a assault rifle or something like that. So I love everyone in the world and I don't want to punch anyone, but I always if there's one person I could punch in the face, there's this guy at my local grocery store who's a cashier and he goes so slow every single time I'm there. <laughs> so here's my answer to that. <laughs> I was mean, just kind of joking around. But yeah. uh all right, man. So, dude, you're a really interesting guy. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm excited to kind of talk to you a little bit. Um, so you got a book. You're an author. Uh, let's see. You got it, you got it right there? Boom. Yes, sir. Modern so day I haven't read it. Without sacrifice. Yeah, so I haven't read it. Uh, but The Modern Day Businessman, I think the interesting part of the title there is Success Without Sacrifice. So what does that, what yep. does that mean? Uh, the, the biggest thing is I've, I've coached now we've reached millions of men every year, but when it all started and I started the company, I coached 600 men one-on-one -on -one before I ever started the brotherhood or anything like that. And it was all with men's weight loss, hormone optimization through all these conversations I was having, cause they all own businesses. I realized that the biggest thing in their life was that they weren't lacking the wanting to take care of their priorities, meaning health, their family, their business. They wanted that. It was typically the things that were outside of their priorities that were always taking precedent over those things. They wanted to do this, but instead they always caught themselves doing these things. So the biggest thing about success without sacrifice is that one, you can have it all. 
right? There was people that someone just posted yesterday, got me riled up. It's like, do you want billions of dollars never have to work again? Or would you like the love of your life? And for me, I already have the love of my life. So that would mean that I would think that I would have to give up the love of my life to be able to have the billions and billions of dollars. What's funny is that, you know, people that maybe don't have the love of their life may think, well, I'll, I'm fine going with the money because I'm okay living right. without someone else. But for me, it got me thinking again, well, I would rather, it, it would easily be my wife. And then I was sitting there with my son in a car, a fake car, posted this picture on, on Facebook. I saw that on your Instagram. Yeah. And he's like driving it. And I'm sitting there thinking, I got this message from this guy who's done a few million dollars now. He's done over $30 million total. And he says, oh, like, that's so amazing. Always comments on me and my son together. And I said, listen, dude, family's so amazing. I physically would not trade anything for it. I would literally give up eternal life, living forever. If I literally, someone said, you can live forever or you can die and have your family, I would have my family. And again, it got to this point where I thought, what the craziest thing is, is that you actually can have all three. Maybe not eternal life when it becomes like living <laughs> on earth forever. Maybe you believe in that stuff. Maybe the though. Done crazy things before. Maybe I'm, I'm There's not also technology and like gene regeneration, but. Totally. Whatever. I, I, I <laughs> believe that you could never die. I'm fine with that. Yet, ultimately, when it comes to health, relationships, business, finances, you can actually have those things. And so the goal is to sacrifice the things that don't matter, that you don't want in your mm. life, to have the things that do matter. And ultimately, you can have success in all these areas without sacrificing these areas that you actually care about. It does take the sacrifice of things that don't matter, though, right? because those are usually the things that take over our lives and, and our dreams as well. And I write lots of stories in the book, which I love. I'm actually reading a book right now that is totally crap. Terrible book, but because it's all stories, it's got me hooked in. I remember everything about it. Whereas I also read a lot of other books that are great facts, figures to the point. A lot of people think they want these things. We are never meant to learn that way. So they tell you all these things. This is what this is, what this is and this is the fact of this. Yet we never retain it and it's hard to tell people about it. And we leave there and these are the people that go, what'd you read about? And they're like, uh, I don't know, like I'm still processing mm -hmm. it. Whereas in my book, they'd be able to actually read off like all the stories. Plus, at the end of every chapter, I actually have a workbook style. Nice. At every chapter, at end of the chapter, there's a bunch of questions that you have to answer that kind of look like that right there. So if you kind of see okay. that, it's a bunch of questions yeah. you have to answer that helps you actually apply the things from every single chapter. So I appreciate you bringing it up. It's yeah, definitely. It took me over three hundred grand to be able to learn and write the book and everything. That's so amazing. A wow, lot. that's a lot. Yeah. So the things that you're sacrificing are things that don't matter. That's, that's, a, that's, that's important. Yeah. And by the way, I love stories. Like I, there was this book as a kid, Aesop's book of fables. And like, I always like remember it, like, cause there's little stories that teach you like virtues and things like that. Stories do 100%. tell powerful lessons that are important. Um, and in business, we say facts tell stories sell. Why do stories sell then? Oh, there's exactly. a lot of things that stories help build beliefs. Should never tell people what to do. And in, in business, I don't tell people what to do. Only people that have invested mass money to build the trust to say, I want to learn from you. I know we have that trust for me to say, hey, do this. And they're like, okay, I'm here to learn from you. Yet right. the, everyone else, why would I expect them to believe what I believe without going through the same journey and process that I went through to build my beliefs? All of us, a lot of times think about coronavirus. I was right. freaking out. I, my son was two months old when it first came right. out and I thought we're all going to die. I locked everything up. And so now I'm not that way. I, I'm not that way at all, actually. I don't judge people that are though, because I'm like, oh, like that was me at the very beginning. Like right. they, I was in that same part of that journey and they may go down the same journey, end up the same way, <laughs> but I'm not gonna be, I can't believe you can't, you believe that way. I'm like, dude, I was there. So one of the best ways, not just in books, but if there's one thing that people leave with from this show is that telling stories doesn't just sell things. People think I'll oh, tell a testimonial. It actually helps people encounter the experience that you had to come to the belief that you came to without telling them. So you can right. actually get people to believe the thing that you want them to believe without telling them to believe it. Uh -huh. And they come to the conclusion on their own and think it was their idea. Right. Dude, and, and you mentioned in my first 90 second question, the Bible, like I'm not, I'm not a super religious person, but I respect the hell out of the Bible because there's some good oh. stories in that, that ultimately everyone can get behind the virtues in those stories. Yeah. And, think, so, and just look at Jesus as like a person. It, how's the dude still got like 3 billion followers? Didn't have social media, didn't have a <laughs> phone. He didn't have all these ways of transportation. How did he do something or speak something? Everyone. 
Every, for us, I work with men specifically, right? So we talk about every man yeah. has a mission or every man has a purpose. Every man has a mission and they have a message inside them. They want to get out into the world. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He had, he was a man that had a mission and, and a message to get it out there into the world. And somehow he did it through speaking. And there's still like 3 billion people. So even if you're just learning from a marketing and how do I get my message Dude. out there point of view, it's like, well, there's no one who's really done it better. I mean, what year is I it? I got to say, Jesus, 20, Jesus is the best personal brander of all time. Yeah. And, 20, uh, it's 20, you said 2020. It is AD. 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 Yeah. Like, AD. It's, <laughs> like even just looking at that, I think it's uh, sometimes I believe people shouldn't be just religious. Religion is like a bunch of rules and all these regulations. Yeah. Look at it for being a great best-selling book. Uh, I 100% agree with you. Also, Sean, I know that we jumped into this 90-second rapid fire thing, but I want to honor you for creating a space like this. I remember when I was 60 pounds overweight, I didn't have a YouTube video, a Facebook ad, a podcast, any of these things to be able to help me out. So I was stuck where I was at because I physically didn't think I could change my situation. And one guy sharing a message with me changed my life forever. Years prior to that, though, when I was before I was 60 pounds overweight, there was a moment that changed my life for the negative forever. And I didn't know that if life can change for the negative, which people have had this happen, my dog got hit by a car when I was 12 years old or 10 years old. And it sucked. My life changed in the moment. I was sad, right? Like everything changed. I was crying. If it can happen for the negative in just one moment, couldn't it happen for the positive in just one moment? So the goal of this episode for me, for the people that are listening, and that's the biggest thing is making it to the end, right, is right. that to have those defining moments where everything just shifts forever. The same, if it can happen for the negative, it can happen for the positive, and you've created a space to be able to do that. So thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've been looking into you a little bit. You did have, you mentioned your dog. That's a true story about you? Yeah, yeah. My dog got hit by a that's, truck in Mexico when I was like 10. Jeez. My favorite dog. Um, like my I didn't closest know dog that. I've ever had. Wow. But didn't, uh, besides for that, you have kind of like a little bit of a rough upbringing? Like, didn't you and your dad not get along or something like that? Yeah. I, it's It's a weird thing because looking back now, for everyone that's listening, no matter what, you did not have a good upbringing. There's not one person I know that actually had a perfect upbringing. Now, things might have been nice and you don't understand right. why you're so upset about it. Yet the biggest thing is, is that perception is reality. So let's say that your parents don't remember any of the things that you got hurt by. Like, oh man, like you hurt my feelings here, or this really spun me down the wrong thing, or you were really rude here. And you have these memories or these little traumas that we have from when we were a kid about something that our parents did or didn't do or expectations that we had. And ultimately, a lot of times we were wrong because we were three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, and we were stupid. Like we didn't know what the heck was going on. We didn't know, understand how to perceive things. We had our own insecurities. And the one thing that's interesting about insecurities mm -hmm. is that let's say you have an insecurity of a smile, of weight, of hair, of whatever it is, wrinkles, whatever, height, wiener size, whatever things. <laughs> I think I have a you bad voice. So yeah. I'll use that one. <laughs> a voice. You're, you have a great voice. Oh, wow. That's, I was fishing for a compliment. So thanks. Yeah, yeah, you got it. So you walk into a room, people start laughing. Generally, people start thinking they 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 spotted them. Oh man, they saw my smile. Like, was it my smile? Is that what they're laughing at? They're looking at me. Uh, they they end up perceiving what people are doing wrong because of their own insecurity. So going back to when we were children, and this happened to me, is that your perceptions are reality. So things that your parents have said to you or said to me, when they said it to me, it hurt my feelings. Now, just because that's not true. They didn't mean it that way. They didn't mean for it to be rude. Whatever it actually is, that doesn't mean that it's not true because that perception is reality and that reality to you is real. And a lot of times when I look back now, I go, man, like my dad really didn't dislike me that much. But at the time I felt perception. that way, which was real to me Dude. as a kid, Dude. even if they didn't mean it. And so it's okay if that happens. So for me, you're, you're right, man. I went through things like Four, four years old, my parents split up. They moved 10 minutes away. My stepmom moved right into my house, had the pressures of feeling like I had to call her mom. And mm -hmm. she wasn't my mom. And she actually wasn't a mom at the time. So she had inherited this four-year-old that she didn't understand or get at all. Meaning I remember getting yelled at. Nothing wrong with her. She's amazing. She messed me the other day. Right. 
She was right. right. Like I was dumb. I was four years old, five years old. And I used to always throw my laundry, right? Like in the laundry bin or not throw it in. Yeah, or I'd yeah. throw it in and it'd be inside out. My sock would be inside out. I get yelled at. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, I don't even know what the heck's going on. Like I was Who's freaking like, tiny. Yeah. I remember getting yelled at by my dad, six years old. He goes, Nicholas, you need to pick up the pace. And I'm like, I'm sitting there for two minutes getting yelled at going, toothpaste like paste paste right. paste i'm like i'm picturing <laughs> toothpaste getting yelled at the whole time going i don't know what the hell is going on a lot of expectation on me as a little kid and and, uh, and again i was dumb she didn't know she wasn't a mom yet so she just thought why is this kid freaking so stupid he doesn't know how to put his socks right side in no i was freaking five six years old and i didn't know what the heck was going on in the world i could barely speak yeah. freaking english that was the problem uh, that Dude, led me into that. perception r is reality. That's so important because that kind of relates to like victim mindset a little bit because it's just how you perceive things. Like I hate a victim mindset. I, my dad passed away when I was 12 from ALS and I had to move. I moved from uh, Syracuse to Chicago in seventh grade and then from Chicago to Pennsylvania in 10th grade. I was the new kid in seventh and 10th grade. These were traumatizing things. And I could look back on that and be like, I'm a failure because my dad passed away. But I perceive it now as like, okay, Elon Musk had to be an immigrant, move from South Africa, like Steve Jobs had a rough childhood. I almost look at it as an advantage. And it's the same situation, but it's a perception and perception is reality. So you can basically take any situation, good or bad, and frame it in a way that helps you to the to the perception you want to give yourself. Is that, is and this is actually right? a, a positive way to actually overcome traumas of the past. Right. Generally, uh, the traumas below eight years old shape the lens that we look through life in, like mm -hmm. everything that we do, the movies that we watch, the people that we talk to, the, the things that people say to us, it shapes our world. And oftentimes the problem is, is that when we get triggered, which is usually a response to a past trauma coming into the now, maybe you're, someone calls you fat or joking around <laughs> and you're like, you're hurt by that. Oh my gosh freaking out and you like want to lash out on them or maybe someone says something to you and you just remember just moments when i say triggered probably people have memories of man i just yelled at my freaking why i just yelled at my husband i just yelled at my kid because they said this and i thought they meant this by it that's a trigger the problem with triggers is that generally what happens is you go back into the size or the age of the brain that you got the trigger in so if you first got mm. triggered when you were four about this you usually act like a four-year-old when you get triggered again, because the trauma, you're almost like locked in a wow. cage at that age, not able to perceive that situation from a different perspective anymore. Wow. So like you were talking about that perception, generally one easy, simple thing that you could do is you can go back with your current knowledge, skill set, understanding, and go back to those memories and look at it from a third party right. and say, what was actually going on? So an example, my father-in-law, he got yelled at by his basketball coach, thought he was an idiot, thought he was stupid, told him he was whatever, dumb, slow, whatever. Mm -hmm. So he was traumatized by that his whole life. That brought him into thinking that all leaders are demeaning and tear people down. That led him into when he would go into his workplace Every time there would be that similar type of leader leading the workforce, he'd always feel like he had to be, he was less than, he was terrible, he was a dog. He was, and all of a sudden, it was like that one trauma affected how he looked at every single leader that way. This is why a lot of people that have daddy issues also don't like Donald Trump, right? He's just like <laughs> domineering, kind of like intense leader, and they see yeah. that same trauma person right. pop up. And, right. and we do this with good people too, right? We have people that remind us of our moms and we're like, oh, right. you're just like my mom. And you see comfort. You're like, <laughs> you're just like this person I know, right? When I was picking out the name for my son, I had this problem. I was like, man, all these names that I like, there's some ass out there that ruined this name. I'm like, I, I remember that guy, Jim, and he freaking ruined this name because he was lazy. And I'm like, I'm what, what's my son your son's Jim. name? Kingston. Do you, so and I, do you know anyone think, else named Kingston? I did. I know a little baby now, and all I know is it's like a capital of Jamaica or something like that. But it's where the king lives, and I'm like, that's a great name. Okay. And there's no one else that I know that's ruined that. And no one me. associated with it. <laughs> exactly. So ultimately, when you go back in these times, he we brought him back through just a little bit of meditation, throwing some music. You got to remember the moment. You got to be present with it. Went back, and I go, what was your coach going through at the time? Right. Maybe he was hurt. Maybe he was triggered. Maybe he was insecure. And so we start. Well, maybe looking he's at just an asshole. Or maybe he's an asshole. 
Yeah. And, but why is he an asshole, right? Even deeper, oh, it's right, like, well, he's right. an asshole because of all these other things. And believe me, there's probably lots of assholes out there. I just find that generally when I talk to people, they're not as bad as they make it seem like. I'm like you're not like the right. biker dude that's an asshole. When I sit down and go, dude, like, what, what's going on? Like, all of a sudden, they're different. They're not an asshole. I can talk to them. Uh, this is like Republicans and Democrats, right? They like yell <laughs> all day. And the other day I got a, a Republican and Democrat together that freaking yell at each other. And we went to lunch and we were like Dude. chatting, small talk and everything. We were all freaking like best friends. I'm like, yeah, oh, for this country, like, that, this country needs more of that, obviously. A hundred percent. And so ultimately we went back to that time and we were able to look at it differently and then change the belief and the understanding of what happened in that moment and release that trigger. The best thing about triggers and people can maybe learn some of this through, um, there's the I method, EMDR. I something, whatever. You can look up EMDR definition. Okay. And one of the things they talk about is let's say that you have a trauma today. You get triggered and you go, I want to be better. I yelled at someone or I got upset about something. I want to be better today. And so you start picking apart what happened earlier today and try to figure out what happened. How could I not act that way? Let's say maybe even you think five years back and you go, I remember five years ago, I got triggered that same way. What happens is you clear when you've to overcome that trauma from five years ago, you clear from five years to now. Right. Yet you still have all these other traumas. The, the benefit is if you go back to the first time you had a trauma, right? Look, going to the root of the cause mm -hmm. rather than going to the symptoms, the fruit, picking mm -hmm. the fruit off the tree, thinking, no, nah, when you pick fruit off a tree, you actually just cause it to grow back faster. It's called pruning. You prune a tree, it grows back faster. It gets bigger. People think that I could just prune my problems. No, you prune mm -hmm. your problems, they get bigger. It's called what you focus on increases. You think if I just don't think if I just don't eat ice cream, I'll get fit. Well, you then you start thinking about ice cream. Don't eat ice cream. Don't eat yeah, ice cream. Don't eat ice cream. Yeah. It builds desire. And then you go to eat ice cream. Back to the root cause. Pull up the root cause. You pull up the whole plant. You go back to the original trauma. And that's the key of it. When's the first time you felt that way? Right. You go back to the original trauma. I remember for me, I was always afraid of being left forgotten, rejected. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that I didn't remember because I was too young was at zero to two, I was in daycare, two to four, I was in preschool. But I do remember this one key moment. My brother was six years older than me and his friends were six years older as well. Mm -hmm. I think I'm about five years old at the time. So they're about 11, which means that the girls that my brother was hanging out with, I was like, those are grown up girls to me, right? I'm like five years old, they're 11. I'm like, oh, like I want their respect. I want them to like me like that. They look so cool. They're cute, whatever. Right. We're playing hide and go seek. And I still remember to this day, I hid in the apartment complex inside of the dryer. I'm in there for like 30 minutes, dude. No one finds me. Finally, I come out and I realized that they just left me there and they just went uh -huh. on doing their own thing. And I felt so That's hurt. Your root. That's your root. I felt so hurt. I felt so rejected and by a woman as well. Right. So there's like so many mm. different feelings there. I just remember getting those little baseball bats, right? There's like those ones that you go to the ball game and you go to professional yeah. baseball and you get these tiny little bats. Little one. I had yeah. one. And I was like, I just want to freaking hit her with, I was so angry, Dang. but I just, I wasn't, I just couldn't do it. I ran up to her and I was like, I can never hit her. Right. Yeah. And I went on with life. Well, through going through these experiences of personal growth and wanting to be a better leader and a better husband and a better father and a better person, it's like, man, like well, there's something there where I felt rejected. Where can I go back and understand this? Around? She's an 11 year old girl. She has her own insecurities. I was a little, wow, that was badass. I found the highest. They couldn't even find me the entire time. And I get to look at it from yeah, you, today's you perspective. You won the game. Yeah, I freaking won that game. <laughs> I get to look at it from today's perspective with new knowledge. And yeah. sometimes guidance with a friend maybe helps as well, helping you figure out and understand this and looking at it from a new perspective yeah. so that you gain a new reality. We talked so, about perspective. Yeah. So, so your father-in-law, when he was had the old coach that gave him trouble as a kid, and then he looked at every leader as somebody who was going to be just as bad as that guy. A leader is an asshole, always. Yeah, was, was he aware of that? Or is that something that once he figured it out, then it basically solved it? Because you notice, oh, wait, this guy's great. It's just my old basketball coach that was a dick. So is the key to it the acknowledgement of the root? And then once you find out how silly that is because they're not connected, that can help heal you? Is that kind of what it is? 100%. He, yeah. he didn't notice that there was any correlation until he went through right. an experience like we just talked about. 
And then he was able to go back. He just still remembered all the trauma and the hurt and all those feelings. And anytime he saw a leader, a leader was asshole, domineering, someone who was uh, seeking control. They weren't seeking to lead. Right. So uh, an example is actually one of my mentors, a Navy SEAL. And every single time he was around this Navy SEAL, he always thought the Navy SEAL was going to call him out, make him feel bad, like pull him down. And this Navy SEAL was like the most encouraging person that I know. Like he always saw the best in people and always encouraged them as long as they just showed up. And, you know, that was pretty much right. it. Like <laughs> if you show up, I have respect for you. And this guy always thought, man, he's going to tear me down because that's what he thought a leader was because of his past experiences, which didn't allow him to ever grow in that type of leadership or that type of relationship. And again, through healing that past conflict, it then shifts the lens that you now look at people through. And now all of a sudden you're able to interact with them completely different. Now wow. I'm shortcutting it a little bit. Maybe talk to like a therapist no, or something. That's, no, that I was going to say it's kind of like therapy. I mean, that's really powerful. I personally think I have like a strong mind and I have kind of dealt with these own things inside myself, but I almost have like forgotten about that. Like if I'm trying to help somebody else, you have to look at those, those flaws and those uh, irrational feelings and then help them go back to the root find it and look how dumb that is. Now look at that situation with fresh eyes. And then that starts the healing process for somebody else. I, I like forgot about and that. Find, That's actually really thing, powerful. One thing that we didn't touch on, dude, is like finding a new belief. So if your belief out of that was that I'm worthless or I'm not valuable, right? Like mine was when I was like, uh -huh. I got rejected by that girl. Like I'm just not valuable. Well, it's like, what's the opposite of that, that I could build a new foundation of belief, a new seed that I could plant. And again, a seed. This is something that's nurtured. That's not just like uh, this silver lining, like silver bullet, where all of a sudden you're like, never going to have a problem. No, things will arise again and test you and try to get you to go back to this old comfortable belief system that right. you've known to love. Yet you've planted this new seed of, I am valuable. I'm a person right. that people want to spend time with me. And continuing to build that belief now builds this new tree this right. new fruit and the stronger and becomes, the tree is the less the, a new problem will will be 100%. a detriment to yeah, it if you, if that's you don't so powerful man. like if you're that's if really... you're secure you don't care about what people of course think or do if you know who you are doesn't matter and again for people that are out there that are thinking man like what about when new problems come i know for me when i became a father new problems came into my life new blessings new problems mm -hmm. one of the big thick quotes that i always stick in my pocket is pressure never creates weakness and only exposes it. When you think right. about the pipes that are inside of my house right now, bringing water to the sinks, if I were to turn up the pressure of the water until the pipe bursts, the pipe doesn't just disintegrate and the whole thing bursts. It right. only bursts in the weakest point first. It's pretty fair, right? Weakest part of the pipe Absolutely. is what Absolutely. bursts. A screw a screw's and, loose somewhere or something. That's the weakest point. Yeah. And so was the pipe did it just all of a sudden get weaker or did the weakness of the pipe finally get exposed through increased right. pressure it was always there right it just wasn't ever exposed because there was not enough pressure there right. so every time that something like this happens and you get a trigger or you get these new problems you think oh, i got more problems to deal with here's more traumas or or you just try to push it down oh i don't want to deal with that if i just don't have any problems i've already deal dealt with a lot of my past stuff no like think look at it as an opportunity you go oh my gosh the pressure's been turned up. Something's been exposed in me that right. was already there. And now I have an opportunity to be able to face it, repair it, strengthen it so that I can withstand more pressure. And so I don't look at it as I have a new problem. I look at it as, oh, wow, this problem was already there. It's just exposed now. Now I can deal with it. I'm in a better place than I was before, which most people, when they're going through problems, they think, oh man, I'm in the worst spot than I was before. Last right. year, I was and so that's, confident. That's perception. That's back to the perception. Totally. I look at it differently. I framed it differently. I go, oh, what an opportunity. Right. I'm better than I was before because I had this problem. I didn't even know it. That's called ignorance. Yeah. That sucks. This is where people say, oh man, you ever have those people that you know that I used to have an employee like this? Uh -huh. This dude was like, I'm so self-aware. I'm self-aware. I'm self-aware. And then always around all the ladies, he'd pop in a bunch of nuts in his mouth and always chew with his mouth open. <laughs> Loud as could be. Like other people can see sometimes are things that we're not aware of. This guy, I was like, I got to tell this guy. He's chewing his tell him. mouth all the time. <laughs> but he was like self-aware. He was self-aware. He was a self-aware person. 
Like dog. Like was he no. actually a self aware person and just not self aware of that? In a, in other in other areas for sure. It's just funny okay. that oftentimes when we think we're up here doing really really good, other people can see it, and right. you know generally people are too scared to be like, hey, where can I be better? I go to my wife a lot of times and I go, honey, where could I be better? Yeah, I'm always so scared. I'm nervous, dude. I'm like, she's gonna rip me a new one. And then it's always like something very small and simple. And I'm like, wow, yeah, you, that, I just do that little thing. And you think I'd be better. It's yeah. very encouraging. And you want Dude, those nice love, people around you. I love that perception. I am so happy when I get like a negative comment or like an insult. I, I've almost framed it for like my dream is to have like a comedy central roast where all my friends like make fun of all my insecurities because people don't like to tell you the things you do bad. And I, I, I need to hear them. I don't care. I'm fine. I just need your perception. Like, uh, actually my by friend the, came by to the visit. way for the people listening yeah. like you're a freaking weirdo i freaking hate that crap but <laughs> I, I love it dude i love getting mocked yeah, um, because it. it's kind of like a, a fun way for people to tell you that stuff i had a friend come visit and he said yo at the end of your youtube videos you have that thing where you say hey like a uh, subscribe he's like i don't like that you should do like a uh sorry my chair's going down here <laughs> he said you should do like um something different at the end i don't like that and i said thank you so much my friend nico and we changed it to something different i'm like but you know, a bunch of other people didn't like that, just didn't care about me enough to tell me or didn't want to hurt my feelings. Like, so I just like yeah. to have the mindset of keeping my, almost telling myself I like to get insulted so that when someone does come up to me and tell me something, I'm like, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. It doesn't hurt me is at it all. Cool it if I, is it me. cool if I rip on that for one second? Yeah, absolutely. Not in a bad no, way. No, no, I'm not secure enough to hear it. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm, hold on. <laughs> Let me rip on you real quick now. All right, uh, do it. Uh, the big thing for everyone listening is that this is where mentors and close people in your circle really come in really well. I believe that everyone out there in the world has two cents to say about everything that we're doing. And ultimately, it's usually only worth about two cents because it has no context. They don't know who you are. They don't know what you've been through. And this is where I love having the paid mentors that I have, the non-paid mentors, the close friend group where I can actually get, this is why I love my relationship with my wife, is that if someone were to say something, I would go to her and Hey, is there truth in this? Like, you know me better than all of these people in the world combined because they've only seen little bits and pieces of me and they put together who they think I am and try to give advice based on whatever their perception right, is of right, me right. and what they feel from it and all this stuff. So you have these close people to you so that when the two cents comes and they say, Sean, your voice sucks, right? Like you <laughs> talked about saying that your voice sucks and some <laughs> some ass goes out there and you you get on Oprah and you're in front of millions of people and someone says, man, this guy's voice freaking sucks, right? Like this insecure guy sitting there in the cheap seats at the basketball right. game telling LeBron James he should have passed the ball. Those <laughs> are the people that yell at you. They're not in the game. These are people that are in the cheap seats. You don't feel that because you go, I got my close group of friends. I got my right. mentors around me that they're not giving me their two cents they actually are close enough to me and are willing to have those conversations. Like for me, I used to not be able to get on camera like this at all. I was like allergic to the camera. I remember actually I have a banana. I just ate a banana right here. <laughs> and I, I filmed my first video. I was eating a banana and I couldn't breathe. I was like, I'm allergic to bananas. I'm allergic to nuts. I don't know what's going on. I found out I'm like allergic to the camera. I was so anxious that I couldn't breathe. I'd be in between sentences and I, and I, I couldn't breathe. And I remember feeling like I'm allergic. I don't know what the hell's going on. And so I remember taking three years of these speaking classes and I didn't want to be a speaker at all. I didn't want to be on camera really. Then all of a sudden I got my first speaking engagement and one of my mentors, I asked, can you help me out get better at this? He got taught from Bill Clinton's speaking coach, mm. which whatever people care about Bill Clinton, he gets paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's a good speaker. To talk. Yeah. Yeah. I've never really watched them, but this guy's coach, I guess, is really good. So, and, and that's just, I just haven't ever watched it. I haven't watched a lot of presidents speak or give a great speech. So apparently gets paid a lot of money. So can you watch this for me? For two years, this dude watched my Facebook lives, my videos, and every like, we'd watch him for like two hours and he'd stop it like every 30 seconds to talk about everything I did wrong. I would love that. And it took me like two years to get a compliment, about a year and a half. And he's, they finally said, that was really good. <laughs> really? Like that was really good. I remember one time I said super awesome 115 times. I just kept saying it. Oh man, super awesome. And this happened super awesome. So he made me count with him, sit there, pause. That's awesome. 47, That's awesome. 48, 49. But again, he was a close mentor. He had my best interest in mind. Right. It wasn't just some random guy on Facebook 
that was giving the two cents because everyone will do right. that. And at that point, you're going to have so much feedback that, you know, it's like right. being so open minded that your brain falls out. That's funny. As you're saying that, I was watching back some of my videos and I actually did like look into a speaking coach and, I'm, and I've talked to him once. I'm talking to him again next week, but I know that I say right too much. So as I'm sitting here, I'm saying, right, right. And I'm thinking to myself, don't say right. But uh, yeah, but my friend Nico is someone right, that I trusted, right. right? I say, right, right. I do it too much, man. I'm trying to work on it. But notice that uh, when I, it depends what you're doing, dude. Notice that when you say, right, I'm nodding my head. Right is called a trial close. You want to get people to nod their head. I have a great friend of mine that's a great speaker, but not a like professional speaker. And she sells lots of stuff, like millions of dollars a week of stuff. And she says, right, more than anyone I know. But really? the whole, everyone is going like this the whole time. So when she I'm says, also a head buy this, yeah, yeah th that's mirroring. Uh, okay. the best waitresses right. <laughs> and waiters head nod they go, oh you want some wine and then, and you're like yeah because you can't <sighs> say no when you're nodding your head yes so there are some benefits to what you're doing i get that okay. you may not want to use it as much Cut as it back a, crunch, a little bit right for sure right see i just did it i just did it but okay right. that's at least not the worst thing it's not the worst thing uh have, yeah, you, done the, have you done the rubber band thing uh no Put the rubber band on your wrist, and every time you say right, you snap it. Mm, okay. I so like it, it just reminds you every single time to do it. This is what right. my, my friends and I <laughs> used to do. <laughs> All right. So this is where count. you'd snap the band, and you'd have this welt. <laughs> By the end of the day, you'd have a welt, and it would remind you every time you catch it so you can actually see when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, you are – yo, so one thing I'm noticing about about – about me and you a little bit is I'm not necessarily a coach. Uh, my podcast is doing pretty well. My business is doing great. And I think that I have a great mindset. I think that I'm doing great myself, but I'm noticing with the things you're saying is that I'm not as good as helping other people potentially because you coach, you, you mentor, and you are probably used to doing this. And I kind of, sometimes I don't think I'm the best because I, I'm like, yeah, just, just don't worry about it or just, but I'm not saying don't get back to the the root of your problem or I'm I'm not as good at, at, at that. So so mentorship, right? I'm I'm always been fascinated by it because like Mark Cuban has this YouTube video that he's like, I don't need a mentor. Now again, that's Mark Cuban. He probably yeah. doesn't need a mentor. Um, and he's he talks also about, an idiot. So <laughs> you think he's an idiot? Oh, he's for sure an idiot. What? Mark Cuban's like my favorite guy. Why do you think he's an idiot? Uh, I don't really know, I'm, but there are anomalies. So real quick, I'm, I'm kind of kidding. I just kind of seeing because you love mentorship. I mean, I, I will defend. I'll argue no, 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 that's not that's not why. Uh, ultimately, there's in golf, it's the same thing. People look at anomalies. They look at Steve Jobs and they say, "Well, Nicholas, why do you invest in your fashion?" Steve Jobs didn't want decision fatigue, so he anomaly. wore the same thing all the time. Anomaly. And so they take the anomalies, the guy who has 190 IQ, who invented things that had never existed before, the 0.000000001% of society, and they want to duplicate the thing that's unduplicatable rather than taking the things that are duplicatable and that are proven to work and, and use it. So uh, Bubba Watson, he's a golfer. Yep. This know, guy has the gnarliest, craziest, funniest swing, and he hits everything the way that you're not supposed to do it. And then you got Tiger Woods, one of the most winning of all time, and all the other most winning of all time, and all the other people on tour that actually even matter at all, that if I ever said their name, they'd be the only people that you'd ever be able to find on Google. They all have a coach. And then there's the one guy, Bubba Watson, that everyone wants to be like because they want to get out of the the feeling of having to have a coach, having to invest in themselves. They use it as a scapegoat to run away from their problems when they don't have the talent of the one guy mm -hmm. out of all the golfers in the world that have ever made it to not have the coach. Mm -hmm. And we still don't know what it's like if he did have a coach. Like, we'll never know that. What, what kind of fair. golfer he could have been. And Very with fair. Mark Cuban, he may say things like, I don't need a mentor and stuff like that. I guarantee you that everything that he's ever learned about investing, business, sales, distribution, everything came from someone else. Mm -hmm. And let's look up the definition of mentor while you riff on that for a second. I'm going to pull this up. Okay? okay, pull it up. Yeah, because a mentor, 
as something that I've been thinking about possibly doing. And I've had these consultants. I've looked into CEO coaching. I had Patrick Bet David on my podcast who talked about uh, CEO coaching. And I mean, I've done over about 20 million in sales. I have 15 employees. It's got a big building. And I'm thinking, do I need a mentor? And I have these like unread emails about to respond back to these coaching classes and these CEO classes. And I'm looking for the reason to do it. So what's the definition of mentor? Okay. So Mark Cuban, I apologize to school you when you got so much money and you own a sports <laughs> team and all that stuff. Yet, because this isn't fair, right? Like he respect has to be given where he's crushed it. Like he's crushed it with money, he's crushed it with influence. He has massive influence, massive money. He's was on Shark Tank or is on Shark Tank. Yeah, he yeah. owns sports teams. I think he's dated hot women. Congrats. Now with that, mentor. An experienced and trusted advisor, number one. Number two, an experienced person in a company, college, or schools who trains and counsels new employees or students. Like, homie, if, if you want to say that you never learn anything from anyone, then right. cool. But for so all, you, all, do, all would the you other- consider books and podcasts that aren't directed directly towards you, would you consider that mentorship? I, I believe that if you look at Thinking Grow Rich, a lot of the favorite book concept of, of mentors inside of there were based on just beliefs, right? They're like, I'm going to act like this person's mentoring me, or I'm going to envision what this person would say to me. Right. Yet, what what's the downside of a mentor is probably my biggest thing. I don't really know what the downside would be. I know with me, for me personally, I would have nothing that I have today without my mentors. Right. I wasn't talented. And this is why I love what I've gone through. I was 60 pounds overweight. I barely graduated from high school. I didn't go to college. I got married at 20 with no job. Uh, but before that, I had no girlfriend for the seven years, like I said. And for three years in business, I never turned a profit. I, I freaking sucked. <laughs> I didn't get friend requests on Facebook. No one gave a crap about what I did. <laughs> I ran my father's company for $19,000 and $21,000 a year, the two different years I was running it. Jeez. I sucked. And so with all those failures got me to emotionally understand what people go through when they're going through those struggles. I'm like, oh man, like I understand. And now we reach millions of people every single year. We've done millions of dollars in sales online and offline, both platforms, millions of dollars of sales from events and, and uh, over half a, mil uh, half a million dollars just from our virtual events that we've done during COVID, et cetera. So again, there's lots of other people that have done a lot more comparisons, kind of like a never ending game. Mark Cuban will always be more rich than you and I, and we're you know, maybe the five millionth best entrepreneurs in the at least right now. But well, he's whooping our ass. Course, That's what I'm saying, course, right? Of course. There's and and there's generally going to be someone else out there who's whooping our freaking ass. Fair and enough. even if they're not on paper, if you want to compete with Putin, who owns yeah. a percentage of every single business in all of Russia, <laughs> yeah, who is by far the most richest person in the world, by far, yeah, but just doesn't get featured on Forbes. We're going right. to lose in that game at some We're point, right? Lose. Or that guy in Saudi Arabia, the king or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and again, the, is it right that Putin owns every business? Probably not, but like that's the rules that he's, he's yeah, willing to go yeah. down that route to be able to get what he wants. And you and he's I- He's going to be richer than us. Yeah, yeah, he'll, <laughs> he'll do whatever. So, right, so yo, one going, more, going, 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 going back to this though, is that <laughs> go ahead, my, go ahead. I, I didn't have any of this, right? I had none of the, I had, I had no skill, no talent, no ability. Even my Navy SEAL mentor that looked at all my speaking engagements- uh -huh. He thought, man, your wife better be the one who builds the business because you don't really have, I don't see how you're going to do this. You don't have the skills, the talents, the abilities. I couldn't speak, couldn't market. I thought I was going to try to be the tech guy. I sucked at that too. And so for me, it was the people that went before me. And I look at it like this. Their ceiling is my floor. Whatever they built in their whole life, all the skill sets, everything they've okay. been through, okay. that's where I start. Because okay. they're like, hey, I'm going to bring you up to the 160th floor. I've already built the foundation. I've already built the building. And where I'm at, my ceiling is going to be the floor that you start upon and you build upon rather than building from scratch all by yourself again right, and learning right. all the same damn crap that they learned around, along the way. And I invested to be able to do that. And yeah, maybe that's why I believe in mentoring and coaching, but mm -hmm. also there's lots of mentors and coaches out there that have never freaking, they don't, they're not a practitioner of what they mm -hmm. preach. For me, you can yeah. just look at my bank account not from the money, but the, the transactions mm -hmm. of the $50,000, $70,000 per year for, let's say, Russell Brunson's mastermind, $50,000 mm -hmm. a year to just be a part of and associated with what so he's that's the doing. only downside is the investment. 
potentially. I don't. I but mean, it's, but if it's you worth look it. at investment as a downside, exactly. It's like, an investment it's is like, an investment. Well, if I invest right. in a property for real estate, it'd be nice to not ever have to borrow money, use other people's money, or anything to do a real estate project. Of course. But you look at the numbers of the upside, and that's the difference between an investor mindset and a traditional employee mindset. So the employee mindset looks at it as a cost. Oh, what's this going to cost me? I don't use cost in my vocabulary at all. I don't use it in my marketing. I don't use it in any of my sentences. It's very hard for me to use the word cost to the point where actual costs, I still call them investments hmm. because an investment is something that pays you money. Yeah. A cost is something that costs you something. No one wants anything to cost them anything. So they say, Nicholas, how much it costs to work with you? Like, uh, I don't know. It doesn't. Like the cost is if you don't work with me, that's the point. Because that's where you're right. missing out. Exactly. You can make yeah. an investment and it gives you a return. That's totally different than a cost. And that's the difference sense. in the mindset of people that do invest in themselves, people that don't, people like yourself that invest in employees. It's not a cost for you. No. Hopefully that actually, allows you I'm actually control. thinking the same thing. I, I use the word cost, but I actually, I was talking about this last week. I was on a live and I don't spend money on anything. Like I don't, someone asked, what's the dumbest thing you spend money on? And I couldn't think of anything because I have the same mindset as that. So I get yeah. what you're saying. I have one and other question about mentors, uh, like specifically, like what things I have a list here. Like, all right. So what are these things would they help me with the most industry knowledge, mindset, specific decision-making or accountability? I'm sure it's all the above, but like, I'm interested in like the specific decision-making and the industry knowledge mindset. I think I'm okay on that. And like accountability could probably help me. But out of those four things, what do you think is like the most helpful for an entrepreneur? I believe it's different for every type of personality. Okay. Some people may, they need that mentor to be like that, that association accountability or, or the, the accountability that's not just like them holding you county, but the social accountability of, man, I'm playing big with this guy yeah. and I don't want to like let him down yeah. and I'm checking in with this guy. So that accountability may help them. For me, it was all around proximity because I just looked at everything else I'd done. So when you're talking about, it's more about the specific decisions that they make all throughout life and the way that they live life and attack it every single day. That was my biggest benefit that I got. Outside of that, it would be the specific questions called just-in-time learning. When I'd run into a problem, whether it be my health mentors or my business mentors, I could ask a question about that specific problem specific. and get an answer right then. Because you yeah, can't get that from like, a book or a podcast. I could. I just have to search for it. Mm -hmm. And what's your time worth? You're going to go right. search for 10 hours on YouTube trying to figure out a specific problem, or are you just going to ask a question and get an answer mm -hmm. from someone who's already done it? Mm -hmm. Like I just say myself 10 hours, what's 10 hours worth? What's the mentor cost? Total difference. But think about this. When I, when I, I've tried to be pro in a lot of different things. So I want to be a pro motocross racer. I want to be pro coffee maker. I want to be the best coffee maker in the world at one the point. Best. I want to be a pro golfer. I have an issue with thinking that I can like be the next Tiger Woods, even though I've never really golfed before. <laughs> so inside of that, one of the biggest things that I notice is there's people that golf all the time and never get better. Like, that's so weird. They get better and then they just stump in their growth. And I realized that the biggest thing is they all golf with like the same people all the time shooting mm -hmm. in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Their expectation isn't really there. They don't think they get much better. They stay the same for 20 years. Then there's these other people that just continue to progress. And outside of our genetics, which can't really change, I was like, well, I'm just going to golf with pro golfers. So I literally started golfing, shooting in the hundreds, like 120, 130, terrible. And I just started playing with pro golfers. I had pro golfer instructor that would instruct me all the time. I play with pro golfers. So I'd only see great shots. I'd only see great strategy. I only learned good habits beforehand. Mm -hmm. How they similar to what themselves. you were talking about with speaking. People mm -hmm. think if you just do it, you'll get better. Or you practice bad habits. Mm -hmm. And then you have to reverse your bad habits rather than learning good habits and then practicing. So I followed these guys who are pro and I learned from the pros. I started expecting myself to shoot in the 70s. In I started 70s? watching people that did it all the time. Oh, dude, I my best game. I was two under in nine holes was my best wow. nine holes. And one wow. over in 18 was wow. my best 18 holes. That's really good. I was eight strokes out of qualifying for the uh, Farmers Insurance Open qualifier that was like in San Diego. So yeah. um, eight strokes is a lot. I got my ass beat. 
total. Still, like, man, that's not incredible. My best, my best day ever was like a 97 or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yet that was in a year and a half period. Wow. From so that shows the power of being around the 70s. That, that positive energy and that. And, those and good so habits. Th- just transfer it to business. Like all of a sudden I realized that, right. all right, if I can get around these people, I could see their habits, the way that they approach things, the way that they do life, right? Outside of just business. Like one of my mentors taught me how to better be a better father, was a business mentor, but it rubbed off on me. If I would have never met him, if I would have never studied him, if I didn't have exclusivity and access, right? Like not a ton of people around him. I had this like, a very small group plus access, the ability to see him closely behind the doors, not just on stage, not right. just the best stuff that's edited a million times inside the book, mm-hmm. but actually see who he was as a human being. This dude always promised to put his kids to bed at night, even if it was on FaceTime. But one night he's across the country and he says, honey, I'm going to wake up with you. I'm going to make you pancakes. I'm flying home. Um, I'll be home in just like a couple hours tonight. We'll wake up in the morning. We'll have pancakes. Flight gets canceled. The dude literally tries to rent a car. His license expires. He hitchhikes, even gets stuck in jail for a minute for something like just trying to get home, makes it there right before sunrise happens. And he gets home just to have breakfast with his daughters. And I made a commitment in that moment. as like, I need to have boundaries and I need to have certain like do's and don'ts. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm not going to do. And this is what I'm going to promise to them. And I just saw this man of integrity. And yeah, is that a business thing? No, but that's a mentorship thing. I learned from that. And still to this day, I think about it every single day when I'm hanging out with my son. So for me, it was all around being around the best. Look at any sport, which is just a more common thing, right? To look at motocross. I told you it's my favorite sport. All of them used to train in secret. They all had mentors, they all had coaches, but they all trained alone. Recently, three riders... They were all competing against each other. They decided that they would hire the same mentor and they would all train together all year round, giving away all their secrets, everything. They've won every championship and been in the top. Now everyone's doing it because they realized that not only did they need the mentor, they needed also the tribe around them that were pushing each other to become better that made them accelerate to become their best. So not only was it mentors, it was also just the environment outside of the right. mentorship. Who am I around? Dude, this has been the thing that I've built my life upon. And this is why I like autobiographies or biographies or all these different, I, I barely graduated high school. So whatever the heck the, each one of those are, I like both of them. <laughs> and it's because I get to see how did they do life? How did they prioritize? How did they make decisions? And when I look at Kobe Bryant's documentary, I, I, get, I look at man, this guy's crazy. When I look at the last dance documentary with Michael Jordan, I I, I don't learn how to play basketball from the documentary. That's not why I watch it. I watch it to figure out how he attacked the day, how he made up things and situations in his mind to motivate him. And how can I each day take those things and apply them into my life? I view that as as mentorship. And the biggest thing that I've gotten from it is that association that rubs off. The quote that sums it all up that I teach is some things are better caught than taught. I break it down inside the book. There's certain things that you come to teachers for to, to learn. Mm. But most things that you actually get are actually caught from association. Wow. That's My powerful. golf instructor dipped chewing tobacco. Uh-huh. I picked up spitting just from being around him, even though I didn't dip. I still spit when I golf to this day mm. because I picked up something that he did not you teach it. me. You caught it. Some things are better caught than taught. That's powerful. That's really that's really powerful, man, honestly. Like you made a good point about the before with finding the problem, finding the root of it. Now about the mentorship, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe throw up some money and get into it. Cause I like that caught not taught. And I get what you're saying. And out of all the specific things I mentioned, I'm I'm looking for something like perfect. No, it just be around these great people. It blends. It with yeah, you. I, l- I look it, at it, the person. They have to have the results, but I look at the person. Are they someone I would switch places with? Or if I did catch things from them, what I want them. So for me, right. I wouldn't go to a a cocaine stripper ass <laughs> sniffing mentor <laughs> just because. Not that I couldn't learn something. Believe me, I know I could, There's something but if I could choose, about. I just don't, I just don't want to, that's not what I want to catch right. because I've been there. 
I hired yeah. those. So you go mentors. around someone you respect, respect and you want to be like and you admire and you want to be like because you're gonna catch it. You're gonna catch it. Like you did with the dick Dude, with uh, golfing. I didn't ever go to clubs and my first mentor that I hired always is at clubs. I started just going with them to be around them. And then I got a drink here, a drink there, and I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like, this is what everyone does. And I'm all of a sudden just like transforming in the same thing. That's why I created my company is I thought, well, what if we had men that wanted to be healthy and have a great right. family and make a lot of money and we all own businesses. And that was what we cared about. Now we've lost 20,000 plus pounds together as a community. It's incredible. Not from just health programs. So you're creating because this is just what we do. With a billion dollar body, right? That's what it's called. A billion dollar brotherhood. Yeah. Billion dollar, yeah, billion dollar brotherhood. You're creating the environment where people can go there and catch the right things. And if they're attracted to that 100%. type of world, that's perfect, man. I respect the hell out of that. Uh, and to kind of go on it, like I, you, you talk a lot about family, right? So you work close. I've seen your Instagram. You work very closely with your wife, uh, Amanda. Yep. Right. So I actually started my company with my now wife. I, I got married in September, recently married. Congrats. And me and That's her awesome. started the company. Thank you. Me and her started the company and uh, we we kind of run it together. And I get the question all the time about, do you have any advice on working with your significant other? I could never do it. And I never really had that good of an answer. I mean, I think me and her work great together. Like she's great. I think I do really well. Like I never am able to form a great answer to somebody else. So I'm sure you probably get that question. What are your thoughts on working with your wife? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So when I look at working with the wife, generally they probably look at you guys as what they would call power couple because you're doing so, yeah. something and building something together. People say that, right? I'm sure they would be like such a power couple because look at the company you built. A result that you've created together right. makes power couple. People look at us and always power couple, right? They want to own powercouple.com and create a power couple podcast and power couple episodes. And one thing that Russell Brunson actually loved about Amanda and I was our dynamic, how we work together. He always listens to our relationship episodes because he's like, man, I just love how they do that. Because for him, that he had all the money and the software and all the stuff, but him and his wife working together was like something they had never really done before. So when I define it, first off, what is the definition first of a power couple? The definition is two people with two different visions, coming together, creating one like-minded vision, and then using their own skills, talents, and abilities in order to get there. Now, that might look different than working together in a business. Depends what the skills, talents, and abilities are. Mm -hmm. The purpose is, is that each person, we have two visions, we've created a like-minded vision, something together, which I'm sure you guys have done. It's like, right. you don't just go do everything that you want to do, and she doesn't just go do all the things she wants to do. You may think, well, where do you want to go on vacation? You're like, well, I love to golf and you love water. So let's go to Hawaii on the golf course. Like <laughs> we created one like-minded vision and we used our skills, talents, abilities to be able to get there. Now think a lot bigger than just a vacation. That might be the mom staying at home, tra tra training up the children to take over the legacy. doesn't matter really what it is. The biggest thing is that first step is, are we two people with two different visions, creating one like-minded vision, using their skills, talents, and abilities in order to get there? So what happens is that these people are either don't work with their wife or they do and it sucks. It's right. one of those. I feel like a lot people, of people right? are like, I could never do that. Oh my God, I can't imagine. How do you do it? A lot of people are like that. And then a lot of the women then, if they're if, if the man's working, the woman's working, or the opposite, right? There might be men at home that are like, right. I, I just take care of the kids. I hear women say this all the time. Oh, you know, I wish I could like do what he's doing because like I just take care of the kids in the house and like try to support him. And I'm like, no. Like, that's not what it's supposed to be like. Like you're using your skills, talents, and abilities in order to get to the vision. And so is the man. So th uh, those are the big things together. The second thing is to get on that same page. Generally, what happens is bringing, enrolling each other into the vision. So one of the conversations you can have, and one of the rules that we have inside the power couple is not trying to get them to buy into your vision. And this, whether you're the woman or the man and you have the vision, you want to buy them in. Because at one point I was the loser that was stuck just carpet cleaning mm -hmm. and I didn't really want to dream big. My wife was like trying to dream big. And then there's other times where I've been going after it. My wife's like, I just want to chill for a second. Mm -hmm. So inside of that, I don't go up to her and go like, what's your goals, honey? Like what goals do you have for 2021? They're like, oh man, like attacking me. I They feel this, all this resistance rather have me having maybe a conversation like, hey, you know, I got thinking like our future kids or 
our kids, we would never want them to get to like 29 years old, 27 years old, and just not really have any more dreams of things that they want and want to do. Maybe we could write down some things together of things that we want to experience in our life, something that we've never done before, and just start dreaming with no strings attached, no, no tasks attached with it. And after you start dreaming again, because it makes total sense, that's called the vision. Now we can kind of compile something together and think, honey, how could we get there? How could we have a, an ability to go to Disney World with and bring our whole family? Or mm -hmm. how could we get there? And now all of a sudden, we're enrolling steps. What are the processes? What are the ways that we could get there? Like, well, if we work together, or if we save up, or if we say no to this, or if we invest in this thing, all of a sudden, there's this creativity because there's an end result that's desirable, that's been agreed upon together, that's been dreamed about again, rather than us trying to shove our visions down their throat going, I want the freaking house, the car, the thing. We need to go out there and crush it. Look at my goals. Why don't you, why aren't you as ambitious as I am? No, figure out what they care about, what it would be like if they had that thing and build that desire in them where they're like, wow, I would love that. What are the ways we can get there? Honey, I believe that together we can get there. Really? Like they want to do it all of a sudden. And then it's like figuring out, uh, is, is that working together using skills, talents, and abilities to get mm -hmm. there? For us, it is. That's what we love. We're both ambitious. We both want to run companies. That's what we love to do. Yet it's also okay if it's not. What's not okay is not using skills, talents, and abilities right. it to could be able be to delegating. support it could be the delegating. main vision, vision of the family, 100%. I feel like most of the and times our, it's probably delegating for the average, a higher percentage of couples. Uh, I I don't think so. No? But that's because I had the immigrant mentality of relationships, meaning the immigrants come to America and they're known as being very hardworking, of course. crush it, don't take anything for granted, take every opportunity, work as hard as it takes because they see the opportunity and they're so grateful for it. And then you have these Americans that- don't really care. They don't take the opportunities. They were born here. They were born with the freedoms, et cetera. How I look at this is similar to the guy who maybe they have their life together. Most men, they just think, first, I got to make the money, get my life in order, and then I can get married. Well, what happens is that <laughs> you have gone through all these experiences to be able to become amazing and well put together and have money and all this stuff. Desirable. Yeah. And the wife now has not gone through any of those experiences right. and can't relate to any of it. Right. So either she's had to go on the same exact journey on her own. For me, we got married with nothing. We had nothing. We went through all the learning experiences together. That's, so because that's of that, we just looked part. at each other yeah. and said, I said, hey, oh, hey, Sean, um, my wife and I, we just got married. We have no money. Would it be better for us to start a business not working, both of us, or both working? Well, both working because that's like two people working on it. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Like we need to make this happen. And so we did it based on what the hell other choice do we have? We don't want to be separate. And we think two people working on a business is probably going to be better than one, even if we suck at it. So right. we had this, like we had no other choice. The problem with employment inside of America, and again, employment's amazing, right? Like mm -hmm. not everyone has to go out there and be like, I'm going to go lead my own thing. The problem with employment is very easy in today's society to make a little bit or a decent amount of money doing very little. And inside of a business, the hardest thing to do is make a little bit of money. It's the hardest thing. Right. So when they get into business or they have this great cushy job, then they go through all these conversations that you're talking, oh, well, maybe it's better to delegate and just have her stay at home and I'll just go to work and blah. I'm like, congrats on having that choice. For me, we were just freaking broke and we needed to figure it out. And I wasn't going to go out there and be away from my family all the time. So I started a business. That was just what I did. And so when I looked at it, I was like, man, it's, it's easier to make a lot of money in a short amount of time than it is to make a little bit of money over a long period of time. It's a quote from Myron Golden. Phenomenal. Definitely. But inside of a business, if you, you right now, I could go out there and market to a business and try to get a sales position and make 200, 300K a year or whatever. And, and I'd be able to make a decent amount of money doing not that much. I'm not having to have all the stresses, the business, whatever. Mm -hmm. When we get into a business, most employees fail because they believe that it's going to be easy to make a little bit of money and, and then it'll be harder once the company grows. 
No, dude, the first $100,000 in business is difficult. You have no case studies. You have no reputation. You don't have a process for delivery. You don't have the refinement in the messaging and what yeah, people like and numbers, what they don't like don't in the reviews. You, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's so difficult. And so that, difficult. that's the three years that I failed. I was like, why is it so hard to make such a small amount of money? Like, I just want to make a little bit of money. Right? People are like, it's just a couple grand a month. That'd be amazing. I'm like, th that's the hardest part is like, you don't have any of that yet. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, now I got the testimonials. I have product market fit. I have, like you said, metrics on metrics. what am I costing to, a, what's the cost to acquire a customer? What's the average customer invest with us? Now, all of a sudden, it becomes easier. So inside of that, I know that that was like a long rant outside of it. Yet the biggest thing with, with, with the you. power couple and should you work together is first two visions, creating one like-minded and figuring out what's the best way that we could use our skills, talents, and abilities together to be able to get there. Is it working together? Or is it not? Yeah. And celebrate both sides of it because both are equally important. Right. Yeah, man. And for me, uh, like that, that's great. That's great. And for me and, and, and my wife, uh, we've been together for like 10 years. We, we basically started from scratch together. And do you guys have and, kids? Uh, we don't. And I was actually, I was, I was going to uh, say, does how much does that well. make a difference? Um, let me just a say lot. one more thing. Then I want to ask you about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We have such an amazing relationship because we don't worry about like stupid stuff. We worry about bigger picture things. And that may, is a powerful thing. So that is if you can have a relationship together where you're worried about your company, it's just a powerful way to live a better life. And then you're not like folding the socks or stupid stuff. You're you're stronger and that's worked great for us. Um, so we don't have kids yet, but how did that affect you? Did that, how did that, th did it throw a wrench into your, your perfect working relationship? Did it, do you have a nanny? Oh, like what, 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 it, what, how did it all play out? Cause I could be there. Yes. I don't know. I will see. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is something that Grant Cardone actually taught me about fatherhood, which is interesting because most people think he's like hustle grind, all these things. Mm -hmm. Grant's dad died, I believe when he was 10. And so Grant remembers his dad at the time, which think Grant's like for pretty old. Mm -hmm. So if he was 10, it's like 50 years ago and uh, decently old at least. So 50 years ago, making 80 K was probably the equivalent of making like 300k or more right maybe right. a little bit more than that per year so he's making good money and his dad every weekend would be out in his awesome lawn mower mowing the lawn which was a two dollar hour job at the time two dollars per hour and he would go from making eighty thousand dollars a year on the weekdays to doing a two dollar an hour job on the weekends and then his dad died at 10. there's a quote out there that says the problem is, is we think we have time. And one of the big things is when you hire or outsource or try to get your time back, you're really just buying your time back at a discount. If you were to hire a lawnmower guy, like a landscaper, he's not really paying $2 per hour for him. He's buying his time back at a discount because his time's mm -hmm. worth more than the guy mowing the definitely, lawn. Definitely. And so the same thing happened when it came to having my son, which we're still learning, he's 15 months. We went through like four nannies because of COVID and all these different yeah. things. And it was very difficult because you catch yourself doing things where you're like, okay, before I had all this extra time. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to use the vacuum in my house and vacuum around, it didn't really matter. Now it's like, if I vacuum, then I can't spend time doing this or spend time with my son. What do I want to be intentional in my time about? So I just got more intentional with my time. I got more intentional with buying back my time. I got more intentional with the value of my time started thinking, why am I talking to this random person that isn't doing any work with us? Because it's literally taking time away from me being able to say goodnight to my son. And it was scary at first. It was super hard. Right? At first, my wife nursed the entire time. So every two hours, nursing for 30, 45 minutes, every two hours. Jeez. Like These were intense things at first. And so ultimately, it's just going back through this. Pressure doesn't create weakness. It just exposes it. Going back to these things, what's our vision now? What do we care about in life? How can we use our skills, talents, and abilities in order to get there? What, how do we buy back our time at a discount? What do we care about? And things that we cared about before we had kids, we now don't care about as much, like getting a best deal on my landscaper. No, I called the best landscaper right. because I didn't want to waste time going through all the landscapers. Exactly. exactly. I wanted to get the best landscape. I'm like, dude, whatever it costs. But, but, so are you, pro na are you pro nanny? Uh, what's your definition of nanny? Um, well, like somebody who can kind of watch the kid and I was thinking also they could maybe 
do some laundry and uh, some dishes and stuff like that while they're watching the kid while we're at work. Yeah, even think about what you just said about the dishes. Let's say your wife washes the dishes. It's amazing. You can learn a lot from washing the dishes. Every kid should learn how to wash dishes. You should be put through the crap of washing dishes. After a while, though, you've learned your lesson of the discipline of washing dishes. Yeah. So where I like nannies is more so how do I get someone who can help support us in all these things that aren't investing into our child so that we can invest in our child? So like you said, laundry and dishes... I'd rather give that up rather than getting a nanny and then doing the li- the laundry and dishes and having them take care of the kid. I'd rather have someone do the laundry and dishes and hang of out course, with my son yeah. or, or right, have my okay. wife be able to hang out with them. So for me, the investment in my son is more valuable than any of the tasks that I do. So inside of my book, I break down priority lists and how you fill your calendar. Uh, they can grab my book for free at nicholasbarely.com slash ebook. Okay. If they want it for free and yeah, don't want to pay we'll get, for it. Yeah. If you want a physical copy, go do it. But just because I plugged it like so many times, get it for free. We're linking um, it up and all that. Yeah. Sweet. So inside of it, it's the investment in yourself because you can't you can't show up for your family if you're like not healthy, can't take care of yourself. Doesn't mean that you have to take more time taking care of yourself. It just means that it comes first. How can you feel empowered so you could show up powerfully for your family? Second, though, is relationships. My relationship with my son and my wife is higher priority to me than my business. So because of that, I prioritize it that way. And anything, when push comes to shove, if things are are pushing, my business is taking over my time with my son and my wife. It's either for short sprints or if it's unhealthy, I have to cut it. I would literally destruct my business right now if I had to and close it down if it was impeding on my family, my son, and my wife. And- that's the difference is most business owners look at their business as their baby. They're like, oh, that's the yeah, same. It's, it's hard for me to wife. say that. It's hard for me to, I like, Dude, it's, my it's business reality, is my baby, you know, is but, I, but I hear the second you hold that kid in your arms, like maybe my mind might. Uh, might well, you could use your wife as an example right now. If you and your wife were fighting and it was sucking and she didn't want to do it anymore. I told my wife, I'm like, this would suck, but like I'd walk away from this and we'd do something else or we'd stop doing these other things in the business that just don't matter. Let's just focus on things that do so that we can, have this part, this unit back. Cause I don't know if you've ever been in a conflict with your wife before, but nothing's fun when you're in a conflict. Yeah, it's like, no. nothing's fun anymore. I don't want to, I don't even want to yeah. work right now. Like this yeah. sucks. Right. Like we never so have that. Serious of that, that conflict, so that's how I build it. Okay. Yeah. What was hey, that? that is, What'd you say about conflict? We, you we never have, we never have that serious of conflicts, like little things here and there, but like, we're just really on the same page. Crazy. And that's I know awesome. it's like, we'll, we'll fight about like stupid shit. Like, uh, I don't even, I can't even think of an example. Like, oh, you, you uh, okay. She was supposed to put together an email for these contest winners for our e-commerce site and she didn't do it. And I was like, I sent you an email. I sent you and our customer service person an email. You were supposed to do it. And I was like kind of mad at her. That's like an example of one of our fights. It was more work related than like home related. Yeah, yeah. And, and she might what, be mad anymore. What you're talking about is like the, the way that we talk to each other in work and at home are very different. When I'm in work mode, I'm like, for listen. You? Yeah. Cause what we don't even really have a wall. Would never, like, like, it'd be tough to, like, just be like, you said you were going to do the dishes and you didn't do them. Like, that's just not the way you normally communicate in, like, normal home. You'd right. be like, hey, honey, like, did you want me to do these? Right? Like, that's the difference. <laughs> Rather than, like, in business world, I'll talk the same way to my wife. I'll say, hey, like, I've said things like, hey, if if you had one of your old bosses, would you talk to them this way? Because, like, this, yeah. this is how the relationship yeah. goes. Is like, I'm leading this company. And I would like to be talked to like the leader of the company, respected that way. Like we've had conversations like that that are hard, but I'm like, listen, I would need to be able to be direct in the company because when right. things come up, I need to just be straightforward and to the point. And that's how we built things. And very much so in our relationship as well. We always are like attacking the problem right there. It's just a little bit different, right? Like for the business, we're looking at the business problems. There's a problem that needs to be solved and it's both of us looking at the problem. And relationship, a lot of times personally, you know, <laughs> it can be like you said something of the opposite. And so we do talk differently in outside of work than in work, but take the same type of approach, which is very direct, straightforward. We don't push things under the rug. We talk about it right then. We get on the same page. And I would say that we don't have tons of big conflicts like you're talking about. Because conflicts build if you don't talk about them. Right. So you, yeah, you we, beat up, you beat we them have right these small away. things that we continually do. Yep. And we're like, hey, what did you what did you mean by saying this? Because the way that I saw it was this. 
And we have those conversations all the time because I get, the, I have that happen all the time. My wife goes, Hey, can you, uh, can you vacuum this real quick before the family comes over for dinner right before this? And my first thought is like, why didn't you tell me this hours ago? Did you have how long have you been thinking about this? Like <laughs> I have work to do, you know, I'm thinking about all this stuff. So sometimes I'll ask, I'll be like, Hey, like, what did you just like not have time? Like what's going on? And, and we'll yeah. have, we'll just conversate right there and like get over with it. But see, that was, that's my problem. And that's the big thing about relationships is whatever our emotions are hundred percent, our fault and our problem and other people's emotions are hundred percent their fault and their problem. And like we can only deal with our stuff. We can't control right. other people, which I think is a good example. Yeah. So maybe that's the best piece of advice. Awesome. If, if someone asked me that question in the future, I'll say if you, if you're a couple who work together, immediately address any issue before it becomes something bigger that affects both your home life and your work life immediately. And then yeah. they have to be two types of people that can respond to that in a positive way, in a, in a way that's like, okay, you can't get mad if someone comes at you with something because they're, they're doing it right at the root of it. So you have to kind of understand that. hundred percent. That's, that's wow. why there's commitment. The commitment in a relationship is what causes more love. See, this is why I'm really big on marriage because it's the physical form of biggest commitment in a relationship. Till death do us part, sick or poor. These are like big commitments that you're saying. So when you get in conflict, an example of a non-committal relationship would be like a random person saying, hey, Sean, Nicholas is an asshole and your show sucks. <laughs> You'd be like, uh, okay, have a yeah. nice life. You wouldn't talk yeah. to them again. You'd be like, that's awesome, dude. Block. Because there's no commitment to the relationship. A good example of this, this is around relationship boundaries. And there's an example of if someone were to broke down on the side of the road and you drive past them, you don't know them, you go, I hope everything's fine with them. If you know them and they're like an acquaintance, you may say, hey, like I'm praying for you. And maybe if it's a friend of yours, you say, hey, if you need a ride, let me know. Right. If it's a family member of yours, you're like, hey, like, if you need someone to pick you up or if you need like maybe to chip in for something to fix the car, let me know. If your wife breaks down the side of the road and the car's broken, you say, hey, honey, what kind of car do you want? <laughs> Completely different ways that you approach different people in the relationship. And ultimately, it's like what happens is inside the boundaries of relationships, you'll have people, if you don't set boundaries, you'll have people that are acquaintances that will act like they're in the wife's spot or the husband's spot. And they'll ask you for everything. They come into your house and they start taking stuff out of the fridge. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what? like what's wrong yeah. with this person? You freaking just overstepping the boundary. <laughs> and then you have other people that are in this family position that never ask you for help ever. And you're like, if they would just ask me, I would have freaking chipped in and helped them out because they don't know where they're at in this relationship. So going back to commitment, commitment in marriage, you have a conflict, which always happens. Most people brush it on the rug and it becomes worse and worse and worse. Why? Because they're scared if we have this conflict, if we hit this head on, it's going to possibly make us break up, split in different ways. It's going to be left, rejected, unaccepted. Now, that's because you don't believe in that commitment in the relationship. When you have the commitment, you can have the conversation. Inside of the conversation, you can understand each other better. And the only way you can love something or someone more is from greater understanding. And each time you have conflict or a conversation, you get to know each other better with the goal of not being right, but understanding. That's the goal of the conversation. I want to understand you. You want to understand me. Let's see, understand each other better. And on the other side of that resolve, you now love each other more. And now you can reset the commitment. And so it's like the commitment is yeah. what gets you to go through the hard crap so you can have the Dude. love again and recommit and Dude, enjoy yeah. life and love people even more. And that all happens first off with having a commitment inside the relationship that's greater than the conflict. Step number one. Yeah, that's powerful, man. And you just have to think about that. Like you can't be lazy in your thinking if you're in a relationship. You just have to kind of go through those thought that thought process that you just played out. And if you do that, then you can just then you can have a great relationship, like you just said, the way you, the way you absolutely just played it out. So if you're thinking that through with every time you have a, a conflict, <laughs> yeah, it just I feel like some people they don't they don't think enough or they're not self-aware enough or they're not their mind's just not turning enough to be thinking about that stuff and if you do you can have such a powerful relationship um this is why i believe for, as a as a businessman or maybe even as a woman and, and i speak to men mostly because i'm like i'm right. a guy i'm not a woman so if i talk and that's your niche, lot, that's your, do, your brotherhood what i do yeah. is that there's areas of our life that we just can't get rid of and when you talk about the wheels just aren't turning and 
maybe they're just the business person or, or they're just this person, the health person, and they're fit. I realized very early with working with all these men and myself that no one's going to work out for me. No one's going to eat food for me. They can help me. I get a coach. I can get plans. I can get a mentor that tells me what to do, shortens the gap, but they're not going to do it for me. They're not going to move my legs on the treadmill. Right. When it comes to the relationship as well, like I can read all the books and hire all the therapists, but no one's going to do it for me. No one's going to have sex with my wife for me, hopefully. <laughs> and if not, I probably should figure out how to do these things. And so it comes down to taking responsibility for these areas of our life that we can't outsource. You can outsource ads lawn and mowing. management, lawn mowing easily, yeah. but you can't outsource the food that goes in your mouth. You get prep, but you're feeding yourself. The conversation you're having with your wife, your family, your bond with your kids, right. you can't outsource it. You can't outsource so it. if you can't you outsource to... it, those are the things that I believe are most foundationally important That's to great. invest in. That's a great way to look at. at it. That's a great way to look at it. The things you can't outsource. Uh, those are the things to be masters of and that to best your time into being master of. That's really well put. I love that. Uh, dude, you're a smart guy, man. I've been really enjoyed talking to you. I got That's one last, I got one last thing. Um, I was kind of seeing if the conversation would go here, but I saw you were like a Trump guy. And, uh, I mean, I, I like the guy too. I was wondering, uh, just, I, I wanted to see if the conversation got here, but I was wondering one, how do you think he went out? And two, what do you think the, like the state of the country is going forward? And if, if you're optimistic. Yeah. So you probably saw my post about Trump. Was that? I, I, I don't saw? know. I was talking with my producer said, uh, I think I saw some posts about him being like a Trump guy or something like that. Got it. Got it. And got it. So, I don't know. So th this is, this is the truth is that politics isn't my area of expertise really though. Either, I yeah. look, I think it's awesome when people are really good at it. It makes me realize, Oh, this is how I am with like business and mentorship and, and men's mental health and all these things. I'm like, this is what I'm really good at. So ultimately for me, I made a post saying who I voted for and I voted for Trump in 2016 and in 2020. I did too. Yeah. Both times. And the reason I did that is because if people don't like me, and I lost 1,700 followers in one day for posting this, a picture of that. me with a Make America Great Again hat, yeah. I said, it's not about the fact that if I like the guy, I don't really know the guy. I've never even talked to him in person. Like, I just know like the freaking things he reads off a card and the jokes that he makes about Rosie O'Donnell or whatever <laughs> from YouTube that, that are funny and He's ridiculous. Pretty funny. He's a pretty funny guy. Yeah, he's super funny. And so when yeah. I made that post, it was strictly about the fact that if people unfollow me, that means that they only unfollowed me because they know me more, which means they would have only followed me if they didn't truly know who I am or what I did. Right. I was like, what if I'm just True. real about the fact that I voted okay. for Trump? And, and if people want to unfollow me for that, then good. I'm not putting on a facade and yeah. hiding myself so I can keep yeah. a follower. So I gained followers and I lost followers. I right. lost 17. So you're not, you're not a politics hours. guy, but you use that as like an example to like just but be I, real. but i but i would vote for trump every day of the week and twice on sunday over joe biden and kamala harris and all these people yeah and uh i think that you know it sucked how it sucked how trump went out i think there's he every went out leader kind of like burning better. down everything on the way down a, a little bit it was it, I, I, I didn't like the way like, he just, went out yeah but he also wasn't afraid to when i look at it it's kind of like the trauma thing i'm like how can i go and put myself in the situation i'm like this guy's like old He's going to die soon. There's not, I don't really understand the motivation. Like he doesn't really gain anything from any of this. So because of that, I kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. So uh, I think he went out, whatever it sucked. Um, yeah. And I believe that. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm not really, yeah. it's not that I'm necessarily a Trump guy, but I voted for Trump. I'd vote him for, for him. <laughs> a hundred times yeah. but if i were there's to actually cool run my him, own there's state, something cool i wouldn't him. i wouldn't but like think about it if you had someone to manage your life and finances would you choose trump to do it <sighs> like be the president of your I life might choose i choose him to like negotiate uh yeah. certain things I, I personally wouldn't so it's like just showing that yeah. it's not my best candidate right. but for uh, the size of america and what america struggles with i would have easily voted for him over and over and over again right and i believe that the majority of people actually did for sure yeah 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 i mean like, I'm not like i don't political. believe that joe biden got 78 million votes or whatever it does seem like a all. lot it does seem like a lot i mean i'm not political i can't control that i voted for him i will say uh, as an optimistic american i love america i love capitalism i have absolute confidence in our country the one positive thing i can take away from biden is 
people aren't talking about politics as much, which I think is healthy for the average person. I think. Dude, I feel like they're talking more about it. You do? I just th- talked to my wife about this today. I'm like, dude, why is everyone talking about politics? Really? People were talking about Trump less. Okay. But I didn't really I care like... about what people said about Trump. But people have all their opinions. Think about every comedian. J.P. Mm-hmm. Sears, which I think is one of the yeah, best, yeah. funniest dude, I love JP. He lives right, like, not far away. And Brent Pella was on my podcast. And I know him and J.P. Yeah, did yeah. videos together. Yeah. Yeah. So him and Brent, let's say, what do they make? Po- what do they make comedy yeah. about? Like, what do politics. the top YouTubers right now talk about? Current events and politics. Current events and politics. Current events and politics. I'm like, was it always this way? Everyone having an opinion on all these different things. So many entrepreneurs that I know personally have gotten into more of the political space. And it's somewhat a- annoying and, and kind of yeah. cool at the same time. I don't really know what to think yeah. about it. But for me, when Donald Trump was in presidency, I didn't really think or really hear about much of anything what? and now that's all i freaking see is wow really? everyone talking about freaking politics really, the whole time really. and definitely more divided people say oh trump divided the country I'm like dog all i know is that people from what i've seen are freaking way more divided now than they were before so <laughs> i don't know i don't see less division underneath biden i don't see less politic talk under biden i see less highlight reels and less press conferences because the homies getting fed freaking answers and reporters (laughs) are getting fed questions all day that are stupid and irrelevant that's what i see yeah i mean i i see it a little differently i see it as people were more divided before maybe they're equally as divided now but there's just less the conversation is about it so people have a little bit of brain space to have a little more intelligent conversations i feel like now post-trump people are talking a little bit more about bitcoin a little bit more about like currency and markets and entrepreneurship and i feel like there's a little bit of healthiness to that, but we got to be careful because that's, that's when they'll come in and get you. in women's sports and beat the crap uh, out of women and all their sports yeah. and break all of their records that they'll never be able to set again. Yeah, you know pretty, Zuby? You know who know. Zuby is? I had him on my podcast too, and he set the women's exactly. weightlifting record. There's this guy, Zuby. He's, uh, he's from- You, you uh, interviewed this guy? Yeah, I interviewed Zuby, yeah. Who is this asshole? Who is this guy? No, no. He-, uh, he did he set, do it like for fun, like to yeah, make yeah, fun he, of it? Yeah, he did, yeah. He said a woman's rate. He's he's very much like kind of on the right a little bit, but he he identified as a woman, and he set the women's weightlifting record, the powerlifting record, and then he and then he switched back to a man, and he did it just to mock how ridiculous it is that men and women could play sports together. And again, I'm fine with men and women playing sports together. Well, if a woman wants to challenge a man and take that on, dude, I know plenty of women that would kick ass kick every guy's ass think about every mma girl competitor would kick your and i ass at the same time oh yeah but not another mma fighter that's a male but if she wants to challenge him then cool but if he's gonna go down and challenge the women that's totally freaking stupid like it's <laughs> well yeah his thing was he just did it he did it to mock no no, no he, fe- he didn't hurt a woman either there's just no, the MMA no, no, fighters just that have broken you. girls skulls and stuff he did it to yeah, that's to up, show how dumb it is, and I I agree right. with that. That's that's yeah. funny. Um, my it was friend kind of, it was kind of funny. To, yeah, my friend wanted to turn a property into Section Eight, and then and then live in his own property, getting paid from Section Eight income. At one point, <laughs> this was like something he tried to do to like expose how stupid it was. Um, did it but work? He ended up he he just he ended up having a it's place a where he could have done it. Work. but he he's like works in Hollywood and stuff and end up getting paid a ton of money. Uh, so he took that over the project Okay, and you can't take section eight if you're making millions of dollars. So <laughs> True. But dude, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, you're a smart guy. I think it's been an awesome podcast and uh, Thanks, tell everyone about your book, where they can find you, anything you want them to do, or we'll link it up. Yeah. I, I mentioned my book a ton. There's two key ways you can grab it depending on what you want nicholasbarely.com slash ebook if you want a digital copy i would never read a digital copy of a book generally if you don't pay you don't pay attention either i just bought one of my friend's books i bought two signed copies and the the audio version i read my own book out like the audio version it's on oh, you, read, you read your own audio version yeah that's awesome sucked. it was I love, terrible i, I love when people hard, do that so. though <laughs> so if you're an audio person head over to audible use a credit and if you want the physical book amazon for sure but also inside of my private facebook group billion dollar brotherhood if people watch five videos if you're like the guy who likes a free book 
no shipping, no nothing, no credit cards. Just watch five videos. It just basically tells you how to be successful in the community. There's no like sales or anything like that. And our appreciation gift is sending people a free book, physical copy, no shipping, no credit cards. All we need is your shipping information. We send it out my own money. I pay for it all. Dude, you're the man. And uh, yeah, tell Amanda I said hi too, because I love seeing other uh, power couples out there. Um, Heck yeah. And yeah, keep up the great work. And Nicholas Barely, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, man. Later, bro.